All right. Everybody with me still? Looking, looking for Nas, yep. Nas, 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 Sleepy Nas, Weak Nas. Okay. Um, so we're talking about Phil talked about solenoid valves, regulators. You know, I introduced the gas powered valves a little bit. Um, one of the one of the uh, things that's happened in our industry over the last you know five to ten years for sure has been this consolidation of control valve grouping, meaning that. Uh, where traditionally you would see a separate solenoid valve, I mean a shutoff valve, uh, perhaps a strainer, control valve, check valve perhaps, can expansion valve or a liquid feed for example, and uh, another isolation valve. The, the, the industry really started to migrate towards uh, multi-valve platforms where you combine that into one uh, single block. And uh, the really the advantages are, and the parts should look very familiar, these are the same parts that, that we've always seen in the field, right? So this is a the traditional bonnet that you would see on a shutoff valve. Matter of fact, with Hanson, it's, it's identical. So it's the exact same valve that you would always see. The top is the same. What's really changed is the body now, instead of having flanges and welds and space in between these devices, it's all in one. It's all in one house. Uh, so what does that mean? That instead of being three foot in a control, you know, in a control valve train, it really loses and reduces about 18 inches or less than 24 anyway. And what, I mean, what does that mean from a technician standpoint? Easier. Yeah, easier, quicker pump outs, easier. There's no flange gaskets to leak or to you know bolts to tighten up later. And everyone curious. You know, I don't know if you guys remember this. This was uh, it, it was almost ridiculous. It is um, uh, OSHA was finding guys for a little while on uh, not having uh, the torques on the flange bolts correct, yeah. right? Hey, where's your torque wrenches? Where's your certifications? Where's your... It's like, really guys? Come on. You must have better things to do. So um, so that, you know, IR did a nice job of fighting that with OSHA to, to kind of eliminate that. It's, really, it's not really appropriate or applicable. Um, so, but it, it, did, it did highlight, right? So one of the things it highlighted was um, they did an end user survey of where do ammonia leaks occur within the systems. And this was a, this was a, a survey they did probably, I don't know, five to seven years ago anyway. And, and it was really about, okay, the, the places where ammonia gets out of the systems, the most common was around gas, yeah, evaporator groups because that's where the flange gaskets are. There's more of them. More hammery. More hammery. Yeah, so all, that's... So with this valve, is what you're doing is you're saying, hey, I'm going to eliminate two things. I'm going to eliminate the flange gaskets because it's direct weld in line. I'm going to, it doesn't, it don't confuse flange gaskets with bonded gaskets. You know, they're still going to have to service the valve, but the difference is it's not, that sealing surface is not in line with the pipe. So you're not having that push me, pull me against that sealing surface where the, the, the main joint here is a welded, direct welded to the pipe. What a lot of guys have trouble with all right. Uh, they may. I, I, you know, what, what I can tell you, uh, what I, what I will tell you is, I think the service intervals, pretty. Uh, I think the common practice is, and it's probably unfair, right? I think the common practice is uh, the maintenance when it breaks, right? That's that's the kind of the, the PM schedule. It's okay. The PM schedule is not, you know, do this every three years or one year or, or six years. It's you know, do it when it breaks. And then when you do a break, then, okay, then I'm going to do these other things. I mean, that's what I've seen. Uh, and, you know, Hanson hasn't provided really firm guidance around that. And the reason we haven't provided the firm guidance around that is because if, if, they, if we put it in writing that says, you shall, you must, what does that mean to you guys? You better. Do you better. <laughs> it means you better, right? You or some, some guy with a, a ticket book is going to start writing tickets. And that's not, it's not, it's, it's an unfair burden, right? And I think my, my personal and professional take on it is it's not about a prescriptive schedule that's a general, not from a general's point of view, right? We could say, uh, as a manufacturer, you take, uh, you know, the valve, you know, the O-rings, whatever, eventually the O-rings do fail. There's no doubt, anybody, it's, it's just a matter of time. Uh, but things that depend, okay, is it high temperature, high gas, is it cycling, is it, you know, there's lots of other factors that go into how long that more rings are going to last. But we said, okay, the lowest benchmark is one year because 
we've never seen an opening fail. And, you know, I'm saying it, it, it just as for conversation I'm having, it's not as a, as a position. We could say as manufacturer, oh, replace that opening once a year, right? Then you'll never have an uh, inadvertent leak, right, or an unexpected leak. Wow, that's not really right. Because, uh, you know, we have valves out there for 20 years that have never had that issue. So um, I think it's more site specific, and even within the site, it's also uh, application specific. Is it, is it exposed to the elements? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the reason that we haven't provided guidance, I don't see it really anywhere else, is probably for the same reason, is, is if you make it too prescriptive, then you're obligated. Now, you know, IAR came out with a new standard. I don't know if anybody of you guys looked at that yet. IAR 6 came out uh, probably a couple months ago. You might want to look at it. You might want to look at it. It's, uh, it talk, it's a, uh, Inspection and uh, it's a, it's a it's a it's it's uh, inspection and maintenance. I think it's yeah, routine maintenance. Yeah, yeah, it's routine maintenance and inspection uh, schedules. And it used to be part of Bolton One Ten. If you guys are old timers, you remember Bolton One Ten was kind of, hey, here's the things we think you should do on this schedule, right? Once a year, once every six, once every three months, it doesn't matter. So just look it up. I think it's I think you go online, IR, you can probably kind of see things that matter, but they talk about you know, compressors and cutouts and leak valves and um, you know they talk about uh, around valve groups, they talk about inspect for rust, expect, you know, leaks, uh, those are the types of things. But, but what I think by then publishing that, I think the challenge becomes just one first awareness, right? You, got, you might want to be aware of hey, what's in there because you might get asked one day, right? Uh, two is um, look, Look at it in respect to what you guys are already doing. You know, hey, does that make sense? Is that something we shouldn't? You know, maybe our schedule says we do it every six months, and IR says do it every three, or vice versa. You know, maybe IR says you only have to do it every nine months, and you're doing it every six. Maybe that's an opportunity to say, hey, does that does that make sense for us? It may or may not, but you want to look at it. And so, um, long story short, on that is really around preventive maintenance schedules are. To me, site specific. You know, manufacturer can give you general guidance, but the guidance that the manufacturer will give you will probably be more aggressive than you want it, than you want, because we have to accommodate all applications, all conditions. You know, things that are on a, a marine vessel out in the middle of the ocean, things that are on the sea side, things that are, you know, getting banged every day, uh, getting banged away on every day. So, um, you know, we, we'll get into, we'll get into purges a little bit. We'll give you a little more prescriptive on purger because it's kind of a self-contained unit. We can use some better guidance around that. But but generally speaking, valves, we haven't really um, outlined very firm guidance on preventive maintenance. We say things like, generally, like once a year, inspect the valve, look for leaks, look for rust, do those types of things, but we don't say, hey, you should rebuild these valves every three years, you should you know, replace gaskets every two years. I mean, we don't go through that uh, level for that flexibility that it offers uh, the end users. How are we doing on time overall? Great. I, I got 10 10, we got till one. Uh, we got till two, lunch is coming in at 11 15. Okay, okay. Um, let me see where our, this thing where I can shave some time, save it more for the per you guys, you guys are, are you guys interested in talking about purgers before you guys walk out of the building? Yes, sir. Purgers, purgers, anybody purgers? Yeah, I'd like to. Okay, so I want to I want to make sure I save enough time for that because there's you know, there's a lot of questions that usually come out during the purger talk. Um, okay, so yeah, okay, so uh, I'll just touch on a couple things. So manual opening stems, you don't see it here; it's on the back side. These are shutoff valve stems. Uh, with Hanson, it's always in the same direction, meaning it's always in for auto, uh, in for manual, out for automatic. I'll describe that before. Um, it's not true of everybody, right? So, you know, if you have a brand X or a brand Y, you have to be very careful to know because some valves, manual is out and the opposite for in. So if you're you're walking up to a valve and you're about to do service, you know, if it's a hands valve, I can guarantee you what it is, right? It's always in for manual, always out for automatic. But if you walk up to a brand X or Y, you may really want to, you know, hold your Make sure you understand the operation of manual opening because what can happen is you think you're manual that you jack open, you pumped out both sides of the valve, but you're actually yeah. in automatic and, and it can be a really bad day. 
So always main open stems. Um, these these valves we always put the valve stems in the upper uh, position. Uh, lots of lots of gauge ports, so you can sense both sides of the valves pressure at any point. So you already have parts in your in your warehouse or parts in your stock room. Um, so if you have a shut hands and shut off valve that you've had for the last 25 years, that same bonnet will fit on the MVP. So from a spare standpoint, you don't have to stock any more spares really. If you decide, hey, the next time we do an addition, we want to put in some of these MVPs, know that for the most part, all these are interchangeable with what you probably already have. This board position is a little bit different if it's a stop checking and expansion. But other than that, all of this becomes the internal piston kits, pistons, all that becomes the same. So it's a nice migration. It reduces that um, space for a quicker pump down, eliminates the flange gasket. Parts are still interchangeable. So all those things kind of, it's a, it's, a, it's a good progression uh, as you go along. Uh, I won't, and you can convert them just like Bill was talking about with the standard. Other than to say that um, from the ex from the outside, you can kind of recognize. I mean, this is a cutaway; it's kind of unfair to show it to you this way. But from the outside, you can you can clearly identify this as a shutoff valve. This looks like a strainer, so there's a strainer housing inside of it. Control valves always in a position what we call position three. So this is position one. This is always position two. This is always going to be shut off. This will always be a strainer. This will always be a control valve. Now the top may be different. Sometimes it might be a pressure regulator. Sometimes it can be a motorized valve. This fourth position varies based on the application. So um, this could be a simple shut off valve. What does yellow mean? Expansion. Yeah. So it's an ex this is an expansion valve. Um, we'll have. Uh, let me see. So this is a stop checking and expansion valve. It's a yellow cap, and then there's a groove in the bonnet. I'm not sure this photo shows it very well, but there's a groove in the bonnet. This is this is kind of an interesting concept that we. Um, so, what we find is um, guys will set the hand expansion valve. Maybe it's commissioned and it's set, and then you know sometimes the evaporator's not making temp, so you know the first thing that happens is the guys opens up the hand expansion valve a little bit more. So that that little tag really is a uh, it's just a reminder where the valve was set originally leave it there so if you want to like I said what the only downside I think of a stop okay the other advantage the other advantage with this valve this type of valve sorry um, is if it's on a liquid line and, and I, I know you guys have probably seen these right so if it's on a liquid line liquid feed to an evaporator this is pretty common, right? You're gonna see a shutoff valve, a strainer, solenoid valve. Typically, what, what do you see after that? Check. Yeah, you usually will see a check valve, and then after the check valve, you might see a hand expansion valve. Maybe after that, you might see a shutoff valve. Depends who, who shutoff valves it is. And so, what do you? What else do you see? This is now. This is a tough question, so I'm not expecting you guys to get it right. What else do you see between the check valve? What else do you see between a check valve and a shutoff valve or the hand expansion valve? Depends on the application. It's a liquid on a liquid line. And on a liquid line to an What do you see? A purge valve. Yeah, a purge valve. Exactly. And why do you that's um, that's a USB drive, it's pretty big and it's got a lot of the hands and stuff on it. Um, why do you need a purge valve there? So on a, on a normal configuration, what you're going to have is you're going to have a check valve, which is a one-way valve. On the outlet, if you isolate, and if you don't do it properly, you're going to isolate that valve. What's going to be between those two legs? That's why. And that's why you need the purge valve behind there, right? 
because you need to bleed off or ensure that you're not going to have pressure built up between that. With, when you go to a stop check hand, when you go to a stop check valve or stop check hand expansion valve, those two seats, the shutoff valve seat and the check seat, are one and the same. So there's no possibility to trap liquid in between because it doesn't exist. So it's one seat, so you can't trap between the two isolations. So, so this is to me philosophically a safer approach because it eliminates. You know, everyone can have a bad day and. This kind of eliminates the, um, what they call administrative controls around when you do a pump out. This doesn't require it because it's, in, in, they say that there's a term um, inherently safer, right? There's the technology they talk now. Um, that's to me an inherently safer design meaning that eliminates that possibility altogether. Not to say what you have is bad or, or what we've done for the last you know, 150 years in this industry is wrong. It's just that, hey, as, as technology is advanced, as uh, different designs come about, there's some advantages, right? There may be some advantages. And it's nothing that you would say, hey, rip everything out, we'll put these in. It's just as you go forward, think not just about, hey, I'm, I'm saving some wells, I'm saving some plant gaskets, I'm, I'm inherently safer because I eliminate that risk to my employees. Uh, and, and in most cases, in most cases, you can use these type of valves on all services, meaning um, these liquid valves are gas. usually, what's that? Yeah. Liquid gas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, this is just showing a variation of the piping system. Not worth spending a lot of time on. Yeah, so here, um, this is uh, just a quick, we call it quick sizing chart. So, so 30 ton, or let's say 25 ton, just to make the lines easier to follow. Uh, so here, the high gas valve, MEB 25, 25 is a one inch. So if you, you know, most people are familiar with this now, but 20 is a three quarter inch, one inch, inch and a quarter, inch and a half, two inch. So from an evaporator sizing standpoint, you can see that it covers quite the range as far as capacities, you know, 30 tons, pretty typical. But what I, what I like to look at is, you know, we talk as you go lower in temperature, the valves get bigger. And here, here's, it's kind of demonstrated here. So same 25 ton evaporator drops down. Uh, here, where are we, look at the 25. And you might get away with a, uh, a one inch valve here at plus 40, that same tonnage, you're all the way up to an inch and a quarter you're already up in an inch and a quarter at plus 20. Now as you drop down even lower at zero degrees, you're up to inch and a half. So this is an example where size matters, right? So same tonnage, but a lower temperature requires a larger valve. This don't worry about, this is just talking about uh, because it's more compact, because there's less fewer fittings valves and the, the, the the travel of the liquid through, or the hot gas, or, or a suction gas through the assembly, instead of going through a three-foot assembly with closed valves where this flows up and down, up and down, these compact valve stations or um, multi-valve platforms, there's fewer, there's less pressure drop across the assembly than you have for the like for like comparison. So a lower pressure drop is an assembly than traditional valves in the, for the same function. You know, in this, oh, sorry, I guess I will show that. So this is showing just a simple shutoff valve strainer, solenoid valve shutoff valve configuration. Liquid feed, 30, in this case we're talking about 30 GPM. So, uh, so that be what we call a multi-valve platform is about eight pounds. That same application, same conditions, would be about 18 pounds of pressure differential across that same valve assembly in a traditional configuration, meaning separate components. So it's more compact, but also uh, has less pressure drop across the assembly. This is just an example. This one I thought, I, I think I like this photo. I'm not sure if I, I'm not sure if it's great or not, but I like it. Uh, what do you see in this photo? 
wrong colors, man. Could be. It could be wrong. Yeah. yeah. It's not probably IAR standard colors for. But I, but I, I like the guy's ambition, right? So he decided to color code his valve stations based on surface. Don't know. It's, I don't know. It's a good idea, bad idea. It could get confusing. You have too many colors, and all of a sudden he thinks he's dealing with the water line. It's actually you know some other thing, right? Uh, but I just thought it was kind of you know it's kind of interesting how people solve you know challenges a different way. So I think I like it. That's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> I, the, the real interesting one I heard about recently is um, is the uh, this guy was using uh, uh, cables to all his solenoid valves, and and he said the first time we did it, they were all black cords, right? And the service guy went, you know, to do a pump out and service the valves, and he took all the coils, just like your spark plugs on your car, right? You know, you take one off at a time, right? You don't take them all off. And uh, didn't quite get figured out until quite a while, oh, quite a while later. So then he started going, "Hey, I'm going to color code my cords, in so I know exactly. Hey, red goes with the red valve, blue goes with the blue valve. So it's interesting. Yeah, like I said, there's lots of different, really good ideas out there. Uh, one of my, one of my favorite, I, and you guys steal this because I talk about it, um, is um, they talk about critical valves, and this actually came from a presentation I was at. I would say this is probably seven, eight years ago or more now. Uh, it was after a, a major ammonia release that was related to a fire. No, actually the ammonia release was there, but it was it was minimized because of this man's efforts. So the uh, plant engineer, which was very uncommon, so it was at a, a, a local RITA, uh, local RITA safety day, and he, he, he asked him to speak about the, the issue, the incident, right? So they had a plant burned down and uh, some ammonia was released but the plant was a total loss and um, it was kind of like you know lessons learned really for, you know and he was willing to share a lot of times companies won't even let a guy talk after a fire because you know they're worried about everything else that could come out of it so he was very open and, and, and he said um, yeah during the incident you don't have time to think you don't have well hey let's uh, let's look at this let's let's go to you know valve group 1A and, and turn off the valve tag number such and such. He said, you don't have time to think. You already have to have that plan in place. And, and the thing that I like about what he did is um, he knew that there was critical valves in the system that had to be isolated in an event, in an event. It was kind of pre-staged, pre-planned. And he said, um, but in a panic, you can't say turn off high pressure liquid line X and X. He said, what they decided to do as a team is they identified ahead of time as a team, here are the critical valves in our system. And he said, okay, so on their P&IDs, every single one of those critical valves was orange, highlighted orange on his P&ID. And then out in the plant, he painted all those valves orange. And then when they, uh, and I thought it was really clever too, he goes, our PM was once a year, we had to validate the function of those orange valves. I mean, really simple, right? This, you don't have to, What's critical? The orange valves are critical. Okay, every year I'm gonna make sure I can isolate my orange valves. And that's their, that was their annual test, right? Um, so when the fire came, they had this big fire, and he goes, he just told his guys, run up, turn off all the orange valves. I mean, it was like, they knew what to do. It wasn't like, turn off this valve, this valve, this. He said, you didn't have time to think. And because of that effort, the, 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 the ammonia exposure was very low, I mean, almost, for everything else that collapsed around it, the, the minimal is absolutely minimal. So I thought that was kind of best practice. I think it's best practice. It's simple. And then when you go through your PMs, like, hey, where are the valves? They talked about shutoff valves. Hey, you have to operate shutoff valves once a year, right? Well, no one has enough time in the, in, in the day to go around shut, isolating valves. And, oh yeah, that one works, that one works. By the time you start it, it'll take a year to get the last one done, right? So uh, they, they kind of backed off. And I think even I, our six, will talk about that is now it's more about the critical valves. You have to operate the critical valves once a year, which ties in perfectly with what this guy was already doing. Um, so it's good practice. Um, if you know which valves are critical in your plant, figure that, figure those out, figure out a way to identify those easily so that under crisis, there's not a lot of explaining that has to be done. Yeah, yeah exactly. Thirty. You got forty-five minutes to lunch.
guys need a little break, or are you guys rock and rolling still? You good? Good, good.